morning and welcome. Uh, many of you were here last week for the start of this course called The Bible in Poverty. My name is Ryan Bonfilio. I teach Old Testament at Emory's Candler School of Theology. I don't know if I said this last week. I meant to if I didn't, but just feel free to call me Ryan um, I, as opposed to Dr. Bonfilio or any other sort of thing. You can call me Coach Bonfilio in uh, hearkening back to my first career as a college wrestling coach, but uh, Ryan will be just fine uh, for our purposes. So um, I so much enjoyed getting started on this course, uh, both because I am passionate about this topic, actually passionate about both sides of this topic. Uh, my life and studies is committed to learning about and teaching scripture. So any chance I have to engage with faithful folks like you with scripture is a joy and honor for me. But I've also come more recently, I would say in the past six to seven years, to care deeply about the issue of poverty and economics and economic injustice and the wealth gap and, and a variety of related things as they pertain to real communities, communities in and around in Atlanta. So to have the chance to bring those two topics together is a joy and it's a high responsibility for me um, because I care deeply about both. So uh, we, I, I join this course with you as a fellow learner and listener and look forward to the conversations uh, that we will have uh, later this morning. Um, just a quick recap of where we were last week uh, in the event that you uh, weren't here with us or want a quick review of where we did what we did. We talked mm -hmm. about five miscalculations that really well-meaning faithful Christians tend to make when they're approaching the topic of the Bible and poverty. And just to recap them very briefly, we tend to underestimate how much of the Bible actually is about poverty. We saw that the Bible really has this central overwhelming concern for issues of economics. We tend to spiritualize passages that talk about material realities. That's not altogether inappropriate to read spiritually. In fact, it's quite appropriate in many regards, but we need to remember that scripture in many places is talking about material reality in the life of the early disciples in ancient Israel. We often underemphasize the fact that Jesus was poor and very likely homeless, and that makes a difference for how we engaged all of his teachings. Number four is that we think that, uh, that the primary cause of poverty are things like natural disasters or bad decisions on the part of the person who is poor. Both of those things are surely possible, but one of the things that we brought out last week was that poverty often happens, or the cause of poverty is often at a systems level. That is, it's a function of policies, uh, systems and social structures that tend to advantage some and disadvantage many. And then finally, last week, we looked at the story of the Good Samaritan. It is a wonderful story about generosity and care for the poor, but we wanted to push beyond that meaning. And we began to think about why is it that many people end up beaten up and robbed on the road to Jericho, that very road that the man was walking upon when the Good Samaritan cared for him. So in addition to caring for the person in need, we began to think about the ways in which scripture invites us to think about how we can address the underlying problems that lead to poverty in the first place. So that was a quick recap of where we're going. I want to pray. First thing I need to do that's very important, I need to let out a very grumpy cat from the room that I'm in. Um, you might be able to hear said cat, but let me take care of her and then I'll pray. Hang on one second. Now, chances are in five minutes, she's going to be meowing to get back in the room that she so desperately wanted to leave just a second ago. Uh, but with all that said, let me pray. And then friends, we're going to see some other cats in the room. It's good to see them. Uh, let's pray and then we'll go ahead and get started. Please join me. God of mercy and grace, we are glad to be gathered this morning. We are glad to be safe uh, in a world that is fraught with uh, disease and viruses and violent weather and so many other uh, challenges and struggles and pain and grief. We pray, O oh Lord, that you continue to bring wholeness and healing to our world, the world that you love so much, and that you bring wholeness and healing uh, into our, our own lives. God, we pray that we enter this time with open minds and open hearts as we explore together uh, the connection between your sacred scriptures and the communities that we are called to love and serve. We pray all of this in your name. Amen. All right, friends, uh, let me go ahead. This is always an adventure. Let me go ahead and try to share my screen. I have an alternative way of doing it this week, which I'm hoping works a little bit better. We ran into some snags last week. 
So let's see how this goes. Can you uh, see my screen right now? You should uh, see some presentation slides. Did that come through? Yes. Yes, good, 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 good. Okay, um, excellent. I have lost you. I don't know where you all went. Um, so hang on a second. You would, I really do this every day, all day. So the fact that <laughs> I sometimes get lost in this is really uh, amazing to me. But let's go ahead and uh, get started. Oh, the first thing I wanna do before we jump into today's topic, which has to do with the Bible and law, I wanna just offer some further uh, sort of things that you might continue to read either along with this course or after this course. If this topic piques your interest and imagination, I would recommend all of these books or any of these books to you. So there's a few that you see on the screen there. One is the one that I've officially recommended for this course called Covenant Economics. It offers a 30,000 foot view about the ways in which the biblical idea of justice and covenant is connected to economic systems. Um, uh, the second one that I find really good, in fact, that I almost recommended for this course was Walter Brueggemann. Many of you probably know him, a long time uh, and prominent Old Testament scholar who previously taught at Columbia Seminary. His book, Money and Possessions, is really, really great. It's not just about the poor and poverty. It's about the topic of wealth and material possessions more broadly in scripture. It would be a wonderful reading companion for this course. It's about two times longer than the Horsley book, so uh, I hesitated in assigning it just for its length, but it is well worth it, especially if you know the writings of Walter Brueggemann. Uh, you'll know how, how rewarding it will be to work through that material. Uh, another great book is, uh, there's actually two, only one of which is shown, uh, Toxic Charity and Charity Detox are both written by Bob Lupton. Bob, I've mentioned before, is an Atlanta-based community developer. I think he's doing some of the most innovative work in the country in terms of economic redevelopment. Um, his two books, Toxic Charity and Charity Detox, really are great in terms of drilling into the practical dimensions of how to approach poverty, even in faith communities, in ways that are effective, just, and transformative. So if you're looking for sort of the next step in practices, those two books are great. And then finally, I recommend the book on the far right by Julia Dinsmore. It's called My Name is Child of God, Not Those People. Julia is someone I know. She has experienced poverty herself for much of the past 50 years. And she writes this beautiful first person account about her experience of poverty. Part of its poetry, part of its story. It's a beautiful book in its own right. And I think it brings us into closer connection to just what it is like to experience poverty. If that has not been your experience uh, or someone that you know, it is uh, good to encounter uh, what that is like, especially from a first person uh, perspective. So with that said, um, let me jump in. I'm actually gonna stop sharing just for this first part of our conversation together. The first thing, so today's topic is we're gonna be looking at the idea of the Bible or the, what the law has to say about poverty. So we're looking at a particular part of scripture. Now the law is a pretty uh, flexible term, we'll put it that way. The Hebrew word for law is Torah, and Torah in the Jewish tradition can mean the first five books of the Bible. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now, if you're familiar with those five books, you'll know that those books include things other than kind of law in the narrow sense, thou shalt and thou shalt not. It includes stories and narratives and genealogies. So generally speaking, we're gonna be looking at those first five books following the Jewish lead of thinking of that as Torah. But more specifically, we're going to be looking at law in a narrow sense of the term, which by which I mean specific collections of things that sound more like laws to you and me, things that say you shall do this, or if this happens, Cecilia, then this, or lastly, thou shalt not, or thou shalt. So things that sound more like legal terminology are collected in various parts of uh, the first five books of the Old Testament. So we're gonna narrow in on those topics and try to uh, get a better sense of how they work. Um, so that's, that is in terms of where we're gonna be focusing uh, this morning. We're gonna be going in and out. Unfortunately, because of time, we can't do an exhaustive look uh, at these topics, as fun as it would be to do so. We only have a, a limited amount of time. So we're gonna look at a, some sample laws and we are going to 
to get a better sense of how all of this works. Let me uh, share one other thing with you. And I am gonna go back to share screen. Sorry for jumping in and out here. I think uh, this should do it. Hopefully we won't lose contact again. Um, I'm having a problem here. Hang on one second. Hang, I apologize for this. My solution uh, to sharing is working, but it's also preventing me from seeing you. So that um, that's not great. So let, let me try to fix this. And we will, let me try one other thing here. I know I'm going to figure out Zoom completely the day after the pandemic has ended. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> but like, I got it. I know how to do it now. Uh, okay, let me try this one other thing. Okay, let's try this. All right. Uh, I'm, can you all see my screen still? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right. So let's, um, let me want, mention one other uh, preliminary matter with respect to the law. And that is, it's a, it's a, I want to mention something about how we make a connection between these ancient laws and contemporary practice. This is an important matter. Very often, um, we can't make a simple one-to-one -one connection. The Bible says this, so therefore we should do this with respect to poverty. And the reason for that is not because the Bible isn't authoritative or we don't take these laws seriously. The reason for it is that the biblical laws about poverty assume a very different world, a very different economic world than the one in which we live. It assumes a primarily uh, an agrarian system where each one of us, for the most part, would have owned a small plot of land and we would have uh, raised the crops we needed to live on that small plot of land. So we didn't have accountants and lawyers and doctors and seminary professors and so on and so forth. All of us virtually would have been small scale farmers. A few of us would have been uh, carpenters or stonemasons or the like, but by and large, all of us would have been farmers. So the laws that we encounter in the Old Testament about poverty assume that agrarian system. Now that doesn't mean that we can't connect these ancient laws to modern practice, but it means that we can't do so, rarely can we do so in a one-to-one -one fashion. What we typically have to do, and this is gonna be our procedure this morning, from the ancient law, we have to think about what theological principle or principles lies beneath that ancient law. What is animating that law? Why does that law need to come into existence? What theology does that law implicitly or explicitly embody? Once we under, to the best of our ability, identify that theological principle, then we can move from that theological principle to a contemporary practice. So it's a little bit of a roundabout route uh, to get there, but that's the way that we can adjust for the very different economic systems uh, that we inhabit. Does that generally make sense, friends? Thumbs up on that? I think you will, will, I'll illustrate what that means along the way, but that's generally what our procedure uh, is going to be. So uh, with that said, um, let's go ahead and move on to our first law. Oh, one other thing, sorry, all of these preludes. Um, the way I'm gonna be talking about the law in general is that the law in total functions to create what I would call flourishing communities. I believe this is a, an idea that we, I talked about briefly last week, this idea that, that at the heart of poverty relief is creating communities of shalom, communities of wholeness, where that wholeness has everything to do with one's spiritual relationship with God, but it also has to do with economic conditions. This idea of shalom in the Old Testament encompass, encompasses, excuse me, both the material realities of life as well as the spiritual richness of one's worship life and one's devotion to God. So we're gonna be talking about the law then in the way in which it functions to create communities of shalom or flourishing communities. And the first point, or one of the first laws that we're gonna look at is one that stresses individual generosity. Could someone read this text for us uh, to get started? You can just go ahead and jump in if you feel comfortable. If there is among you anyone in need, a member of your community in any of your towns within the land that the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards your needy neighbor. You should rather open your hand, willingly lending enough to meet the need, whatever it may be. 
Deuteronomy Great. 15, 17. Great. Thank you for that. Sorry, I kept interrupting. I forgot about the, <laughs> the, the line at the end. Um, so a couple things to notice here in this passage. It's, it's a passage that on its surface expresses the need to be generous to those, uh, to those facing material poverty. There's a few things I wanna point out about this. The first is, uh, has to do with the very first word that we see there. If there is among you anyone in need. Now in English, when I say if, it, uh, it's, uh, it suggests that maybe there is or maybe there isn't. So if this circumstance should arise, here's how you are to respond. It's a very common form of law. If this happens, then do that. But what's interesting in this case is that the Hebrew word that gets translated as if uh, more properly means when, right? It's not wondering if this is gonna happen. It actually says in the Hebrew, when there is among you anyone in need. What the ancient authors of scripture knew, what God knew is that this was going to happen. There was no uncertainty about it. There will be people in need in our community. So when we encounter them, not if, but when we encounter them, here is how we are to respond. We are to respond, and I love this, this imagery, not, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted, but rather be open-handed toward our needy neighbor. Where else have we encountered, can you think of any other places in the scripture where we have encountered this language of being hard-hearted? Does that ring a bell at all for anyone? Whoops. Do you think of any passages where we have seen that before? Or people who have just been described as hard-hearted? The whole people of Israel are described that way in their relation to God frequently. That's right. Yeah, in various places, especially the, uh, the book of Judges and other places where we see Israel collectively fall into sin. They're described as hard-hearted. And I think that description draws on an even earlier description of someone else who's said to be hard-hearted. Does anyone else know what that is? It's Pharaoh. In the book of Exodus, Pharaoh is described as being hard-hearted. And the reason I'm highlighting that here is because one of the things we noticed last week is that this uh, sort of the cause of poverty at a broader systems-based level is typified in what happens in Egypt. It's typified under what happens with Pharaoh. Pharaoh was hard-hearted towards those in need, whether the Israelite slaves or his own people that Pharaoh enslaved. Pharaoh extracted from them all of their surplus, all of their goods, even their labor and their land, uh, and so I think what this passage is remembering or, or calling the Israelite uh, follower of God to do is don't be like Pharaoh. You know what it's like to be under the rule of someone who is hard hearted. That's why you were enslaved. That's how you suffered. So therefore, don't be like Pharaoh when it comes to people in need in your community. It's appealing, in a way, it's really about empathy. It's about kind of recalling these experiences where Israel itself was economically oppressed by a tyrant ruler. And it's saying, you know what that is like. Don't do it and don't be hard-hearted or tight-fisted, but rather open your hand. And that's such a beautiful imagery of, of um of generosity is the idea of an open hand. Now, this idea of individual generosity, I mentioned this last week, it's not the thing that the Old Testament continues to focus on. Um, it's assumed, I think, in the law that people would be generous. So much so that in later Jewish tradition, the idea of being open-handed to the poor, the idea of engaging in individual acts of charity became, uh, became recognized as one of the highest virtues in the Jewish religion. In fact, this idea of individual acts of charity uh, came to be called, oops, uh, tzedakah. Uh, the act of caring for the poor was a, called an act of tzedakah. And that word that you're hearing there, it's a Hebrew word I've transliterated into English. Tzedakah means righteousness. So to care for the poor in the Jewish tradition is an act of righteousness. It's a fulfillment of the law. And one of the really interesting things is that in the centuries leading up to the time of Jesus, in the Jewish tradition, caring for the poor, the, the poor that act of tzedakah 
was thought to be more important than any other law in all 613 laws in the Jewish tradition. This act of caring for the poor was the most important law. In fact, um, at about the time of Jesus, this was so much the case that caring for the poor in Judaism was seen as a fit alternative to offering sacrifices at the temple. So even though we think of offering uh, sacrifices at the temple as central to Jewish identity and Jewish worship, and it was, uh, in years, as the years went on, caring for the poor was thought as if, uh, or was thought to be equivalent of this act of worship at the temple. So in caring for the poor, one didn't just uh, care for one's needy neighbor, but one really participated in an act of religious devotion. In ancient Judaism, they didn't sort of divide the world that, in the way that we sometimes divide the world between like community service on the one hand and worship on the other. In ancient Judaism, and I think Jesus embodies this himself, both acts of love for neighbor and love for God were combined. The borders there were very fuzzy and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and would go back and forth. They didn't have sharp distinctions in those areas. So here we are at this, this idea of individual acts of charity. It's at the core of what the law has to talk about, but most other laws in the Old Testament actually go on to talk about addressing poverty at a more, uh, really more at the level of causes, or maybe a better way to say it is that uh, most of the Old Testament law focuses on how the community responds to poverty, not just how individuals respond to poverty, but how the community as a whole responds to poverty. And we get a sense of this here in this second law that I'm about to highlight. Uh, and it's a law about gleaning. We're going to look at a passage from Leviticus uh, 19, 9, and 10. And I'm wondering if someone uh, might read that for us as well. I will. Go Great. Thank you. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall not strip your vineyard bare or gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord, your God. Great. Is this a familiar passage to you? Have you all heard this before? Yes. Now, I know I know Leviticus is not exactly the most favorite book of most Christians in the Old Testament, uh, but maybe a law like this uh, has you've heard it before. It's actually uh, if if you're familiar with the book of Ruth, this idea of gleaning in the field actually plays an important role in how that narrative develops, because the Moabite Ruth goes to glean in the fields of um, or Naomi uh, and, uh, and Ruth go to glean in the fields of Boaz. And that's a big part of that story hinges around that. So catch what's going on here in this ancient practice. This is your plot of land, right? Uh, so Tom has this land, it's been in his family. He plows it, he pulls the weeds, he plants the seeds, he cares for the seeds. Now it's harvest time and it's his land. He did all the work, but according to this law, it is not for Tom to pull in every last ounce of the produce, right? You're to allow the edge, you're not to pull in the harvest from the edges of the field. Now the language here is not very precise. Um, we don't know how big an edge of the field was in this wonderful way that the rabbis do. They, they, uh, they want to become, they want it to be more specific. So in the rabbinic tradition, the edge of your field is 1 60th of your land. So if you had 60 acres, which would have been uh, way more than, uh, well, anyway, you can do the math. It, it, it's one sixty of your land. It's a really, really small bit of the land uh, that you were to allow um, others to come into your field, particularly the poor in the area. And remember in the ancient world, one of the reasons why people would become poor in the first place is that they wouldn't have land to farm on their own. Or if they had land to farm on their own, Maybe their crop was ruined by hail or pestilence or flood or some other natural disaster that left them without the staple crops they needed for subsistence farming. So in those conditions, everyone, every last one of us 
one of us, was to leave the very edges of our field unharvested. So let's think together about this for a second. So this is the, that's the ancient practice. Obviously, not many of us, or maybe none of us, are, ancient, are farmers. So how do we think about this practice of gleaning, translating uh, into the modern world today? Well, let's think about uh, what the underlying principle of this law is. And I think one way to think about that underlying principle is that it, it, it places a limit on our potential for profit for the sake of others. It places a limit on our potential for profit for the sake of others. What's so radical about this command is that this is your land. Uh, this is not land you have set aside uh, and sold for some community developed purposes. This is your land and not harvesting to the edges of the field necessarily puts a limit on how much produce and profit you can make from this plot of land that is rightfully yours. And the driving function is that care for the community uh, warrants putting limits on our own potential for profit. And I think that's really hard in, in America more broadly. And I don't think it's necessarily about capitalism or any sort of economic system. This could happen anywhere in the world under any economic system. But I think it's hard in America because it strikes against how we typically think of things, uh, where we feel that our freedom is always to maximize our profits no matter what. And then hopefully after maximizing our profits to the greatest degree, maybe then we can be generous with some of the products or, 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 or profit that we receive from it. Um, but this law is placing a limit on that productivity, on the ability to profit. Now, here's a little quiz for you. What do you think it's called uh, when you break this principle? So when you don't, uh, when you glean to the edge of your fields um, and you don't leave the edges for the poor, what do you think that's called? Or what word would you put toward that, uh, that practice? If you violate this command, what do you think it would be called or should be called? Greed. Greed, Greed yeah. That's a really good word for it. Selfishness. Selfishness, yeah. Would you be considered stealing? Aha, uh -huh. very good. All of these apply, greed, selfishness, but the word that the Bible uses for it is stealing. In fact, that's the very next line. You shall not steal. And this sort of mixes up our, our ethical systems, right? Because how is it stealing? It's your land. You planted the seed. You did the work. But yet in the biblical ethic, in the ethic that God has given us, using it all for us and not for the aid of the community is actually theft. It's an actual violation of one of the Ten Commandments. Now, that is a radical system, but this is the way in which uh, the Bible gives us something quite transformative when it comes to poverty relief. It invites the whole community, all of us who are farmers, to participate in this, uh, this I, I, I wanna call it generosity, but I really think that's, that that's not adequate to the term. This, this act of sharing uh, and allowing community uh, participation in our property. Now, let me ask one other thing, and I'm actually gonna jump out of the, the screen share for this so I can see you better. How is this practice of gleaning, how is it different than a food pantry or a soup kitchen or something like that where you've kind of gathered food and you give it away to the poor? Is it the same or is this practice something different? What do y'all think? I think it's different in that okay. it is, it's personal. Ah. If you're, you know, you're taking from your profit uh -huh. And allowing and allowing it to be taken by people in need. Great. Yeah, I think I think you're on to something there. Let's let's push that further. In what way go further on how is this more personal than a food pantry? Let's say well, food pantry, you're, oh, giving, excuse you're giving you're giving you're you're taking you're, giving, you're choosing, but here you're saying Think of someone coming into your home and now exactly. they get to choose before you eat. They get to go through 
uh, you know, you went to the store, you got all your groceries, everything that's on the outside of the counter, they get to pick. Yeah. Versus when we do food pantry, we decide what we don't want and give. Damn. Damn. Good. That's, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, great thoughts. Any other thoughts on that and how it's different than a food pantry? Well, the, the person in need participates in the g gathering of their own food. There, it's it's not a handout. It's more much more of a sharing situation. Exactly. So beautifully said. I think there's more dignity here, if I may use that word, um, because people. Uh, it's not that you go and and gather the harvest and then give one sixtieth of it away. Rather, you're inviting people into that work. And if you ask anyone who has gone, had to go to a food pantry, it can be a humiliating experience. No matter how wonderfully loving and generous the intentions of the giver are, it is hard uh, to do that. And, and so here you're actually inviting people into that work on your property. I can just imagine the ways that this brings the community together, right? It levels the playing field in some ways between the giver and the receiver by putting them in the same place, by inviting them onto your property and having them share in the labor. You can almost imagine you being out in the field, laboring alongside the person who is poor. And what sort of relationships develop? What do you learn from them? They might be better farmers than you, right? Just because they're poor doesn't mean they're not good farmers, right? It might not be their right. fault that there was a flood on their field or, or locusts came in, they, you might learn <laughs> something from them in this process. So think about the mutuality that happens in this encounter, right? And that's something that I think we all would want to see happen in our response to poverty, but sometimes our mechanisms like food pantries, and I, I'm using that as an example, food pantries can be lovely. I, I don't mean to be um, disparaging them, but I think it's harder to get at some of these levels of like mutual, uh, mutual exchange and personal relationships through some of the mechanisms that we use. And I think here's a principle of mutuality and sharing and togetherness that I think we have to find ways to embody that in our responses to poverty in our world. Does that make sense so far? You all with me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, well, let's, when I was thinking of an analogy, a modern analogy might be that Say you're a business person and you have to decide um, pay pay scales or wage levels or whatever, and you don't you don't squeeze it to the maximum extent. You nice. you leave some on the table. You maybe don't pay the very lowest possible wage that's yep. going to maximize profit, but you say, okay, let's let's leave a little in the field here. That's right. Oh, I love that. And that's, and we can embody this in different ways, right? It, the, we can move outside of these agrarian uh, kind of the, the, the form of agriculture to get at the function of how these laws work. Um, let me build another element to this because we've got a, a, a few more to look at. And let me go ahead and share screen again. Okay. Um, so I want to build on this idea of gleaning in the fields. And I want to go to the to an aspect of the tithe. Now you all know what a tithe is, right? It's in the, the ancient Jewish tradition, it was literally giving one tenth of your earnings from the year. Now that wasn't cash earnings in the ancient world. It would have been produce, right? It would have been one tenth of your crop, one tenth of your wheat or your olives or your grapes or something like that. It was one tenth of your uh, production that you gave to the temple and the temple would use it to support the priests and the reason the priests needed actual food is because the priests in Old Testament law, they didn't have land of their, of their own, right? So they were not small scale farmers because they were called to do the work of temple ministry. So in everyone giving of a tithe, you are actually literally paying for the food or providing the food that would sustain the priest. Now we know this idea, we have brought this into the modern church, uh, we think broadly about the idea of tithing and giving to the church. But here is one aspect of the tithe that's often overlooked. And I have to say, I've never heard this passage used in a capital campaign. And I think you'll see why in a second. Uh, would someone read this for us, please? <laughs> 
Every oh. third year, you shall bring out the full tithe of your produce for that year and, and store it within your towns. Mm -hmm. Some of my screen is blocked by the pictures. The, Le yeah. um, the Levites, because they have no allotment or inheritance with you, as well as the resident aliens, the orphans, and the widows in your towns, may come and eat their fill. Yeah, very good. So what is this saying, right? It's saying every third year, instead of giving your tithe to the temple, you leave your tithe locally in your local community. You gather it up. Why? So that you can support the poor in your neighborhood, right? So every third year, you don't give your tithe to the temple. You devote it for caring for the poor. So this, is a, this kind of takes this idea of not uh, reaping to the edge of your field and extends it further, right? It's another limitation on your ability to maximize your profits um, in a certain way. But it, it goes a step beyond that, not just because it's now a tenth of your field, not just a sixtieth, but because it's framing the idea of giving to the poor as a type of tithe. And we, again, typically think of the tithe as a very uh, spiritual offering. It, it's used to support directly the work of the church in our modern context, or the work of the temple in this ancient context. We think of it as money that is to support the work of worship. And here, that same money is being given to support the community, and in particular, uh, those who are poor and experiencing poverty. And I think in doing this, what it does once again is to blur those lines between church and community or the sacred and the secular. I, in fact, I think those sort of divisions that we often have um, would have been really strange and foreign to those who wrote and read scriptures long ago. They would have understood giving to the poor as something deeply spiritual. They would have understood that giving to the poor in this way in that third year was an act of worship and devotion to the temple. And I think the temple would have understood and expected that not all of the tithe um, would go to them. Um, now, there is a practical matter here about, well, what happens in the third year when no one sends any of their tithe to the temple and everyone keeps it locally, right? I mean, the, the priests need to eat and that would be a problem. So what I suspect, friends, is that not every town and village was on the same synchronized system. So, you know, if Buckhead in 2021 was giving, was keeping its tithe to the poor, maybe Dunwoody in 2022 was doing that. And in 2023, um, Atlanta proper was doing that. So there was sort of a, a rotation such that in any given year, two thirds of the people were giving their tithe to the temple and one third of the people were giving their tithe to support the poor. So I don't think it ever left the temple with what, uh, without what it needed to, to exist and to thrive, but it also meant that at any given time, one third, for, to, like, to use a modern term, of charitable donations were going to the poor. And that was in addition to this law on gleaning. So it's beginning what you're seeing here is this larger community effort uh, to provide a network of support uh, for people who experience poverty. And remember, back from that Deuteronomy passage that we started with, it, it, there wasn't a wondering about if someone would be poor or if the, the issue of poverty would exist. They knew the issue of poverty would exist. And so these are the ways the Israelite community begins to structure its society and its way of being to systematically uh, support those who are experiencing economic disadvantage. So does that make sense so far? Any questions on, on that one, the triennial tie? I have a question, Ryan, uh, just real Please. story. Um, when I first read this years, years ago, I thought it was very intriguing. So for one year, I didn't give to the church and okay. I put my ties in the savings. And anytime someone called me in need, that's what I used to help someone. That's kind of how I interpreted oh. it at the present day. And it was amazing that people who probably, and I was a single parent with two kids and people who never would have called me, I think that when you do things, 
that, um, you know, God brings things to you. And just people who would have never called me would call and say, I just need help with my electric bill. You know, any right. way possible you could help. And I was able to bless a lot of people that year when I did that. So that's just kind of how I interpreted it when I read it. Great. Thanks for sharing that. Any other comments or questions about this one? All right, let's move on uh, to a fourth. We, we, if, if we have time, we're gonna get to six of these. We've done three. Let me add, uh, let me add a fourth. And this one, uh, we're gonna skip that picture. Um, this one is gonna seem totally unrealistic in light of where we are in America today, but I wanna unpack it nevertheless. There are laws in the Old Testament, in fact, it's repeated in numerous different law codes that prohibit charging interest on a loan. Now, my family, we just refinanced our house, as I'm assuming a number of you might have considered doing so with the incredibly low interest rates uh, being around, what is it now, three or maybe even lower in some circumstances. It's, it's crazy. But in the ancient world, and this, according to this law, there was a prohibition against charging interest on any loan. Let's read the text together. If you lend money to my people, to the poor among you, you shall not deal with them as a creditor. And what that means is don't act the way a, a, a typical creditor would act in that you would charge interest. You shall not exact interest from them. Now, this seems so crazy to us because so much of our banking and economic system hinges on charging interest, even if those interest rates are really, really low. But to get how and why this would have worked, we have to think about who would have taken out loans in the ancient world. Now, I, I, you don't have to literally raise your hand, but if I asked you to raise your hand about who has taken out a loan uh, throughout their life, I suspect that every single person in this Zoom room has taken out a loan and probably multiple loans. Some of you might have multiple loans out right now, whether it's for a house or a car or maybe student loans, right? It, we are in America, one almost by nature takes out a loan. In fact, I remember uh, when I was uh, in my mid twenties, I went to buy my first car. I had sort of inherited some old family cars up until that point. But I went to buy a car in uh, in my mid twenties, and I didn't have any debt. I had a, I was making enough money to afford the car, but I was not approved for the loan because I had no lending history. I couldn't show in my credit record, even though I wasn't in debt and had enough money. I didn't have a history of loans that I faithfully paid back just because I didn't have any loans. So in an embarrassing moment, I had to have my dad co-sign for my first car, which was no big deal, but it felt embarrassing as a 25 year old. Um, in any case, the point here is that in America, we just assume that people have loans. It was not the case in the ancient world. And we actually get a hint of that in this passage. It says, if you lend money to my people, and then there's this little parenthetical phrase, to the poor among you. And friends, what that is acknowledging is that in the ancient world, only the poor would have ever taken a loan. People who were middle class, let's say, or rich, they never would have taken a loan. They didn't have an economic system where to build a house, you had to take out a loan, or to buy a car, you had to take out a loan. The, the economics of the ancient world didn't work that way. The only people who took loans were the poor. And the only time the poor took a loan is when, again, their farms failed and they had to take a loan literally to survive. Not to get a bigger house, not to get a second car, not to do grad school. They had to take a loan because if they didn't, their families would literally starve. So the whole system of who got loans and why loans were given were quite different in the ancient world. And that helps us better understand then why it was important not to charge interest. If the economically vulnerable or they're only ones who need loans in the first place, to put high rates of interest on those loans would have been absolutely devastating. And we have records from Mesopotamia and other parts of the ancient Near East where the loan rates were astronomical. They were so, so high. They would have crippled the very people who needed the loans to survive. And that's why, and here's a really interesting Hebrew tidbit on this, the word for interest is neshek. Um, that's related 
to a Hebrew verb, nashak. You can tell there that the vowels change, but this, the consonants which are in yellow stay the same. This is very common in Hebrew. The same set of consonants, if given different vowels, can, uh, can alter the form of speech. You can go from a noun to a verb. Well, interestingly, when you see the verb nashak, from which the word interest or neshek is derived, what that means in the rest of the Old Testament is this. It's the bite of a snake or the bite of a viper uh, is what that verb is used for. And I think it's no accident that the word for interest is related to the verb uh, to describe the bite of a snake because interest can be venomous and crippling to someone who's already economically vulnerable. Um, now, again, so, so that's the idea here in this ancient law. And I think the principle beneath it is how do you create a system where the economically vulnerable can be supported through loans, but in a way that does not add to the economic burden that they're facing. So how do we bring that into the modern world? Well, this is a place where I don't think the answer is to abolish loans or to abolish all interest on loans. That would be sort of that literal one for one move, which I don't think has to be or should be the way we interpret this. But I think it can mean that the church and people of faith should think about certain aspects of our system of loans in America. And I wanna just give, up, give one example of that. And I wanna talk just briefly about payday loans. Have you all ever, what is a payday loan if you have heard of payday loans before? What, what are they and how do they work? Does anyone know, anyone offer, wanna offer a, a guess on this? Actually, again, I'm gonna jump out of screen because I like just to, I can see you all better when I'm not sharing my screen and I like that. So what is a payday loan? I'll give you no. a paycheck. I'll give you a paycheck uh, now a, a week before it's available to you. And then when you do get your paycheck, you're gonna, you're gonna give me 20% of it or 25 or 30% if they're high, very high interest loans. Yeah, that's right. Like they're short term, super high interest loans and people are forced into them only when they're need for some extra cash is, is desperate, usually for food or for rent. Um, and payday loans are a big business in America today. Um, over 12 million Americans rely on payday loans on a regular basis. That's a lot of people relying on payday loans. Um, loans typically vary, they're not big, they typically vary from 50 to $1,000. And full repayment is typically due in two weeks. There's some variation on that, but. So if I give uh, Eleanor, you know, this $500 loan, Eleanor owes that back to me um, in two weeks time. Uh, now, the interest rates on, on, <laughs> on payday loans are astronomical. Guess what, guess what the APR is on a payday loan for two weeks? The average, um, any guesses? You know, a credit card is what, 13 or, or sometimes lower actually. Um, the credit cards be anywhere from like 12 to 25. Guess what a, a, a payday loan is? 30, 35 percent is on there, maybe. Yeah, it's it, yeah, that's right. It's it's three hundred and ninety one percent. Oh, APR of three hundred and ninety one percent. And sorry, Eleanor, if you can't pay me back in two weeks and you have to take four weeks, the APR jumps to over five hundred. Five hundred percent. Here's what that means. If uh, I loan Eleanor five hundred dollars and she can pay it back within two weeks, she has to pay me $600. And if she can only pay it back in four weeks, sorry, Eleanor, but now you owe me $714, right? So almost 50% uh, of the loan you owe back to me, uh, in excess of the loan you owe back to me in four weeks. Now, if Eleanor, sorry, Eleanor, I'm using you for this example, but it, remember in the ancient world, if she has to seek a loan, she's already economically vulnerable. There's already some issue of desperation at hand. And this is true, friends, today for people who seek payday loans. And so then to face that level of, 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 uh, of interest, it, it, it ensures, if it doesn't put the, the person seeking the loan in a uh, worse position, it assures that they stay in that system, that their need for payday loans continues, right? It's hard to get a footing if you're having to take these loans and pay them back at that high rate of an interest. So what can the church do about this, friends? Well, one, someone just put it through in the chat. I think, Velma, it was you, but right, just to name this as immoral, right? That payday loans are immoral. 
They are, a, they are antithetical to Christian values. Um, so what do we do about that? Well, we can raise awareness about this issue, uh, depending on how you, if your church feels comfortable with this or you as an individual feel comfortable with this, we can advocate for changes to laws uh, about payday loans. Or uh, there, I've even seen churches do this, not many, but a church I work with in Orlando, St. Luke's uh, United Methodist Church, which in my mind is like the Trinity Prez of Orlando, uh, in just in sort of the, how I know that church and, and its makeup, it has essentially created a micro loan system for its community. So instead of uh, sending the poor in its community to payday lenders, people can come to the church, take a small loan, and I think they, I think theirs actually is zero interest. Um, so yes, people are still in a bad position, but now they can take the loan. They can, they can have the immediate stopgap of the money to provide what they need, but they don't face the exorbitant interest. And they do this to an incredible and transformative effect in the Orlando area. And it did not take a ton of money that, for them to do this, but they were able to pull some resources together financially to, to essentially stand in the place of payday lenders. And I don't know what it will look like at Trinity Prez or in other communities to do this, but I invite you to think about these things, right? Alongside of our individual acts of charity, how can you as a faith community be a system of support, maybe in a larger, more systemic way, uh, in a, maybe in a way that embodies something like this? It's possible. Ryan, it's not easy, but it's possible. Go ahead. Ryan, isn't, it, um, isn't this somewhat like the international loans that are made to women to start new businesses? Yeah. And um, I can't remember the name of the organizations that do that, but. One of them is Thinka. Because I did. Another one. <laughs> Another one is Kiva, K-I-V-A. I, I participate in Kiva. Mm. Yeah, these, this idea of microloans, I, I, and I'm now also, lastly, forgetting the, the name of the person who really pioneered this uh, and what that organization is called, but they're not, it's not an old concept. Uh, it, it's relatively new. It's typically oriented towards international development or sort of like startups and, and various things, but there's no reason it can't be focused internally. And, and done at a local level for those facing uh, great impoverishment. It's, it's a similar concept, at least the way that the uh, St. Luke's Orlando Church does it. It's a similar concept, but focused to very particular local communities. It's sort of like the teach a man to fish, but you're, you're enabling a person to create a business to then pay it forward. I mean, there's that whole pay it forward thing also where you get help, you succeed, and then you give help to others as opposed to gathering all your success and keeping it yeah. to yourself. Yeah. We had a member of our congregation, Bob Patillo, who had a microfinance uh, firm mm. organization, very successful uh, cool. for his investors and very successful, I think, for the, uh, the, the people that he helped. I presume they were small loans to uh, primarily in African countries, but I'm not, mm -hmm. not sure. They were mm -hmm. third world countries, so I know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is this kind of like the idea behind, I don't want to enter into politics, but when the legislators came up with the idea that we will lend you an amount of money so that the business can continue so that when the pandemic is over, they were forgivable loans. Mm -hmm. had to follow mm -hmm. a certain protocol and inform things, but kind of that idea that in order for you to survive, we will lend you some money so you can continue paying your people. And, and then once this is over, you can work, continue work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, a, you know, I have to say, Julie, I never have never thought of it quite that way, but I think you're on to something. There's, there's something, it's not an exact parallel, but there is a general idea there in that you take someone or something that's in distress, um, maybe for a reason not of their own doing, actually, probably for a reason not of their own doing. Um, so maybe it's different than sort of the bank bailout, where the banks were sort of, you know, this is maybe getting too far into economics, but one could argue that the yeah. banks were more culpable for their position. Um, that's debatable, perhaps. But uh, it's a situation where you're trying to help someone out of a, 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 a out of a, a, a ditch. 
just to give them a level playing field. And, and that's how it is with poverty so often that poverty is a, uh, is a, it's not just a lack of something, but poverty often is described in terms of entanglement. Like you get entangled in poverty, meaning that it's not simple to get out of it because one thing leads to another. Like if you, um, you know, if you, if you have a car problem and you don't have the money to fix it, you might not be able to show up for your job. If you can't show up for your job, then you're not going to get your paycheck. If you can't get your paycheck, then you're going to lose your, your, you can't pay your rent for your apartment. If you can't pay for the rent for your apartment, that might have uh, ramifications for childcare, right? It's just like one thing leads to another. And I think the no interest loan idea in the biblical world, at least, is trying to short circuit that system of entanglement and give people a chance to get back on their feet. It doesn't guarantee that they'll flourish, but it's trying to, to uh, remove some of the impediments to such flourishing. Um, this is great, friends. Well, I Again, have a question. Yeah, go I ahead, have Sam. A question. Uh, the Hebrew ethic of concern for the poor, concern about the well-being of the community, how distinctive was that in the ancient uh, Near East world? Ah, and such a good question. What, what, and what is the origin of it? Uh, did God say X, 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 and oh. therefore this is the way it's implemented? Could you, I mean, that's a general question. You may not want to uh, answer it now, but uh, I have it in wonder. Yeah, it is a great question. Let me try to answer it. Uh, quickly, although it's, it's quite complex. So in some ways, defense of, or care for the poor is not uh, completely unique to the Old Testament. So you could look, for instance, at the law of Hammurabi, that 18th century Babylonian law code, and you will find in that law code certain uh, statutes that are designed to protect the poor. So that idea is not completely unique to the Old Testament. However, there are some things that are completely unique in the Old Testament. Here's one example. Uh, it, we haven't seen it yet, but we'll, I think we'll start seeing it next week. Um, the, when the Old Testament names the poor, it names three categories of people. It says the orphans, so people without parents, the widows, mm -hmm. and the strangers. And the strangers is a term, ger, that means non-Israelite, who has come to live in the land of Israel. We would use the word alien or probably better refugee uh, for that category. One distinctive of the Old Testament is that in Hammurabi's code and in all of the other ancient Jewish law codes, provisions are only ever there for the orphan and the widow. The stranger is never included in the other law code. So nationality is a prerequisite for receiving care in the ancient world, but not so in the Old Testament. By including the stranger, it opens up the ethic of economic care to anyone, regardless of, they didn't think of citizenship in the way we do, but they, with regardless of national origins, cultural background, citizenship, and so forth. So that's one thing that is very unique about the Old Testament. The other thing is, is this that there's far more, the density of concern for these laws is different. Um, there's more laws about the poor uh, in the Old Testament. And then finally, the other thing the Old Testament guards against, and this is interesting, uh, particularly where we are in the world today, uh, is that uh, another thing that the Old Testament does uh, that we're not gonna have time to get to this morning is that it, every seventh year, the Old Testament stipu stipulates that all debts are canceled. So not just that is there no interest, but every seventh year, all debts are forgiven. So whether it's uh, Eve or Anne or Larry or Peggy, you have a, you know, you have a, I have a loan out uh, in the seventh year, the debt is wiped away. Now that happened sometimes in the ancient world. But interestingly, in the ancient world, kings would announce the canceling of debts only when they were falling out of favor <laughs> with their with their population. So a king was in trouble or the rebellions were popping up throughout the land. And so the king, as sort of a political stratagem, would cancel debts so as to curry political favor. 
the Old Testament cancels debts, but in setting it up in this one in seven year principle, it takes it out of the hands of the king, right? Another way of saying it is that the Old Testament depoliticizes care for the poor, right? It's not a way to gain favor in your political party. It's not a, a way to stay in office. It's something that has to happen every seventh year, no matter what party's in office, no matter what king is on the throne, and no matter what the king's popularity is. So Sam, these are just a couple of the ways where, though not completely unique, the Old Testament takes care for the poor uh, in, in, a, in a more profound and more transformative way than we see uh, throughout the rest of uh, the ancient world. This is a great question. And, and any other questions? I mean, your all's insights and comments are so, so rich and good. Any other questions about where we've been? How does Shara, Shara, the uh, Islamic Shara law fit into what we're talking about right now? I think that they charge, they charge interest, but maybe the not usurious interest. Yeah, gosh, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm not familiar enough with that Islamic practice to, to comment. I, I, I'm making an assumption it's only that, that it has something to do with these ancient laws uh, in the Abrahamic tradition of not charging interest. But I, I'm sorry to say, I don't know more than that. Now, friends, I know that I need to get you out of here because we're at 1046. Um, but let me, in my last word, let me just point to just some of the trajectory of these other laws. What we have seen this morning is only a small sampling of laws from the Old Testament that are designed to protect and provide for the poor. There's many other things if we had a lot more time we could have mentioned. For instance, the releasing of debts every seventh year, we could have talked about that. We could have talked about how every seventh year, all of our land is to be used for the care of the poor. So this goes beyond the idea of not leaning to the edge of your field. It goes beyond the idea of the triennial tide. Every seventh year, all of our land is to be opened up to the poor. Uh, every seventh year, slaves are freed, and slaves in the ancient world aren't like uh, our history of slavery in America. You became a slave because you were impoverished, so impoverished that you literally had to sell yourself as a worker, a non-paid worker for someone else's land to work off your debt. Well, every seventh year, uh, the slaves are let free again and again and again. These laws that try to address the broader issue of poverty keep coming up in the Old Testament. And to go back to that idea we started with uh, that of selective vision, if you go back and read through Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and so forth, these laws are gonna jump off the page to you because they are so many and they play such an important part of the law code. And to say one last thing and, and further to Sam's point, the reason, the core of this ethical response to people in need, yes, it's love of neighbor. It absolutely is that. But it's also, uh, in the Old Testament, God is described and defined. If you look at Deuteronomy uh, in various places, God is described as a God who cares for the orphan, the widow, and the stranger. This care for the economically endangered is at the heart of who God is. And because each of us has been made in the image of that God, we are to manifest and reflect that same ethic of love and concern about those facing poverty that God does. It's written into the spiritual DNA of ancient Israel. And by extension, it ought to be written into our spiritual DNA as well, not just in giving generously to individuals, but as communities coming together to find ways to radically support and provide those who are economically disadvantaged. Uh, again, friends, there is so much more to say about the law. Next week, though, we are gonna go on to talk about the prophets. What do the prophets have to say about poverty? Um, and this is gonna help continue our conversation about the law because very often the prophets are drawing on the law as they make announcements and pronouncements about the world in which they live, but the prophets also extend the ethics that we've encountered in the law to something larger and even more transformative than what we've encountered here. So friends, that's the topic that we're gonna to turn to next week, the Bible or the prophets, uh, poverty and the prophets. Um, we are officially done. I'm gonna hang out for about another 10 or 15 minutes. We are uh, officially closed. You're welcome to sign off. And if so, uh, be well, stay safe, and we'll see you next week. But if you wanna hang out for 
just a few minutes of casual conversation, please uh, stay on and we can chat.